What's your earliest memory? What about your favorite memory? Least favorite? Think about the totality of your lived experience. Isn't that just a series of memories, some better than others? It's our memory that accounts for our time and that defines our life. It's what enables us to learn, to know things, and to recognize people. A well, memory is an important cognitive process. Cognitive processes in general are what help us and other organisms with some cognition to navigate our environments and situations. With this lesson, we begin to explore the phenomenon of cognition and eventually to understand memory. In psychology, cognition is the mental process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. In this course, we've already examined perception, the cognition of our sensory inputs, and we've also explored learning, which is a kind of experience. The concept of memory plays an important role in cognition. It has a relatively simple definition in psychology. It is learning that has persisted over time. But of course, we can quibble about that definition too. How long does learning have to persist before we can call it memory? And what if you've learned something but don't yet know that you know it because you haven't been asked to demonstrate it, as with latent learning? Is that memory even though you might not know you've learned? We'll continue to explore the fundamentals of memory in future lessons, but for now, let's look at some of the major cognitive processes around which our understanding of memory is based. When considering cognition, psychologists often use a variety of information processing models to describe how humans acquire knowledge and understanding. Often, these focus around the role that memory plays in cognition. For instance, there are many things that just seem automatic as we do them. Riding a bike, or if you're already a knitter, knitting a new scarf, or driving to work. These are examples of automatic processing the unconscious processing of well-learned information. We often call behaviors like these specific ones muscle memory. Basically, automatic processing is something that doesn't take as much additional thought to do because you already know how to do it pretty well. In contrast, effortful processing requires both effort and attention. Effortful processing best describes the cognitive processes of learning. Here, Effort refers to the need for practice or rehearsal of the information, like when you're learning how to play a new instrument, or trying to figure out how to perform a new dance step, or a new soccer move, or learning how to write a successful DBQ. These behaviors require attention and effort in order to learn them correctly. We also process information in deep or shallow ways. Deep processing is the processing of information with consideration of its meaning and connections, of its significance. It requires lots of rehearsal and practice, and deep processing most often requires the connection of new information with information that has been previously learned. It also leads to better memories. In contrast, shallow processing requires less rehearsal, as it just uses surface characteristics to process information. For instance, when you use visual appearance, structural processing, to help learn or remember something, or when you use auditory characteristics, how something sounds, or phonemic processing, to learn or remember something. For instance, I can certainly learn how to play individual notes on a guitar. I can find a video on YouTube and mimic how the guitarist places her hands on the frets, mimic the sound that the guitar makes. Learning how to play an individual note is shallow processing. That's not really learning how to play the guitar. In order to do that, I'd have to learn how to connect my hand positions and how the notes sound together, create chords. I might have to learn how to read music or at least figure out how to recognize guitar parts when I listen to a song. Learning how to play the guitar requires deep processing. Our attention is also an important part of the cognitive process. We've already learned about selective attention when we studied perception how our brains can filter out extraneous stimuli when we're focused on one or two. Divided attention is when we're purposely doing two or more things at once. This is sometimes called multitasking. When two or more behaviors you're exhibiting are automatically processed, when you're washing dishes and singing, multitasking is fairly easy. While some humans think they're good at multitasking while also attempting effortful processing though, 
Studies show that is not correct. When our attention is divided, our brains actually switch very quickly between the two or more tasks we're doing. That quick switch may not be noticeable when you're washing dishes and singing your favorite song, but it's very noticeable when you're both trying to pay attention in class and also playing a video game, or when you're doing your homework, but also watching your favorite show. When you're trying to multitask actions or learning that require effortful or deep processing, your brain fails to learn effectively because it misses important stimuli necessary to that important processing. Perhaps the most significant of the cognitive processes is metacognition, the awareness and understanding of one's own thought processes. When you think, when you reflect on your own thinking, you are able to plan, monitor, and assess your performance, your learning. Metacognition includes an awareness of how your thought processes affect you as a thinker and as a learner. For someone interested in metacognition, it's not enough to see that they earned a B on a test. Well, certainly, that assessment grade indicates strong proficiency in a subject. But they'd want to review the questions they missed and the ones they got correct to figure out why they selected wrong answers. Not just that they didn't know or remember the material, but why that might be so. Did they miss class the day that material was covered? Did they zone out in class and miss taking down some important notes? Or... Did they not study for the test or not study that topic for the test? Did they misread the question and or the answer choices? In reflecting on the different aspects of their performance, learners can use metacognition to identify academic weaknesses so that they know what they need to do in order to achieve better academic progress. As we've noted before, the brain, both what we know of its workings and what remains a mystery, is amazing. In our upcoming lessons, we'll explore the role that memory plays in our cognitive processes, and we'll also explore how distortions of memory and distortions in our thinking can affect our behaviors.